Week six is here, and the two best teams in football are on by, but don't let that discourage you. There is a phenomenal slate of games up ahead of us, which we are going to accurately predict with 100% clarity, certainty, and consensus. Starting things off, we've got yet another London game, and last week I went into how stupid of a concept the London games are, so I really don't need to reiterate that. This week, Jaguars take it on the Bears. It is technically a home game for the Bears, but the Jaguars, massive fan base in London, very popular. They play half their games over there. And this would normally lean or lead me to pick the Jaguars to win this game. They played phenomenal offensively against a much worse Colts defense, but I just don't see it. I don't see them pulling off an upset against the top five defense, against a quarterback who has been playing better and better as the weeks go on, admittedly against worse and worse defenses. And funnily enough, if you look up the stats, the Jaguars have allowed, I believe, the most passing yards per game of any team in football this year. So the trip through Candyland for Caleb Williams continues. He's going to have another above average game, hopefully doesn't throw any interceptions, keeps things rolling, gets the Bears to four and two, and beats up on the Jaguars in London with Trevor Lawrence. I don't think the Jags offense can't hang in this one. Everything points to the Bears winning this game. What we saw last week, the Jaguars almost blow a big lead to the Colts, Joe Flacco, and a defense that was atrocious. It is going to be much harder for them to move the ball against the Bears, much like it was the first four weeks of the season for them, where their offense just couldn't wake up. Now, I do think Evan Ingram is playing this week so that'll give their offense a boost from that perspective and maybe Tank Bigsby continues to take on a larger role in that backfield as he's been more productive than Travis Etienne but their defense is just not there. The one thing that I do think is an X factor is the fact the game is being played in London. The Jaguars have gone there every single year the past 11 years, I think it is. So Trevor Lawrence has made that trip. A bunch of other players on their roster has, have played overseas before. And for the Bears, for Caleb Williams, they don't do it as often. This is Caleb Williams' first time going internationally to play a football game. So I could see that being an issue, both in international games we've seen take place this season kind of had weird outcomes whether it was the London game last week or the game in Mexico to start the season so a bunch of nonsense and shenaniganry I mean those are pretty predictable outcomes the Vikings and I believe the Eagles were both favored to win those games how it happened not so much but I don't think the outcomes are unpredictable. I would agree with that, but the way the games played out were weird, and who knows, with the other things taken into consideration, I could see the Jaguars pulling it off from that perspective. Much like you, I just think the Jaguars' defense is too bad. I hope Caleb Williams takes another step forward in his progression as a quarterback, and I also have the Bears winning. I mean, you look at the game of 300 yards to two or 300 yards to Joe Flacco, allowed Deshaun Watson to complete 65% of his passes, have his best game of the year. The Jaguars are playing two games in a row in London. They're staying over there for a week. If this was the second one of those games where they had properly acclimated to the environment, to the time schedule, I would pick them to win, even though the Bears are a much better team. But... I just don't see him doing the first week over there. Next up, we have the Commanders heading to Baltimore to take on the Ravens. And the Commanders have an offense that is capable with hanging with this Baltimore team. But they just don't have the defense. You take a look at what their defense has done this season. They allowed nearly six yards of carry to the Giants, Bengals, and Cardinals. Granted, they won all of those games, but when you're playing a Ravens team that has the best rushing attack in the NFL between Lamar Jackson, Derrick Henry, Justice Hill when he gets in there, and then you have to play the Ravens defense, which may be the best defense you've had to play all season long, all it takes is the Ravens defense to get one or two stops, then Lamar Jackson, Derrick Henry score every single possession. So I do think this is going to be a very high scoring game, like every single Commanders game has been this season. I don't know, it was like, what, 20 to 15 against the Giants? I think it was 20 to 18. A very high scoring affair. To Besides be the game against the Giants, but the Andy Giants... Jones drags his competition down with them. The Giants do have a very solid defense. They just don't have the offense to go with it. Ravens, much better offense than the Giants offense. And I think their defense will be able to take care of business. I have the Ravens winning, although it would be exciting if the Commanders... Pull it off. Yeah, the commanders don't have it in them, unfortunately. I think we've reached the point of the year we are overhyping a rookie as a great star. Jane Daniels is by far the best first year quarterback we've seen so far. Better than Williams, better than Knicks. Haven't seen May, Penix, or McCarthy yet. Doesn't matter. The Ravens defense is going to do what they did to CJ Stroud last year. Slow him down drastically. Hinder the running game, which the commanders statistically have the second most productive running game in football this year. 
That is not going to be a big factor. Their secondary is the area of weakness per se for this defense, but they've had to play Dak Prescott, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes. Had to play uh, four elite quarterbacks so far in the year, and the Raiders, who amusingly enough, they lost to. Joe Burrow as well. So I don't think their secondary is as bad as you might think at a glance. This is a great defense. It's going to greatly hinder Jaden Daniels. It is going to keep the hype train from continuing on, knock it off the tracks. Maybe they get back on track next week. But their offense is not going to be productive. You already talked about, oh, they're going to run over them with Derrick Henry and Lamar Jackson. They're not going to score every time. That's wishful thinking, fantasy football mindset. But they're going to score enough. They're going to have firm control of the clock. And this game will be over quickly because both these teams love running the ball. Give me the Ravens. Not a particularly shocking pick. They're a touchdown favorite for a reason. And we are on to the Packers, who are hosting the Arizona Cardinals at Lambeau Field this week. And I want to like the Cardinals. I really do. They keep finding ways to win games they really shouldn't. Upset the 49ers last week. Their running attack, phenomenal. Maybe even better than the Packers with how great of a mobile quarterback Kyler Murray is. But I just don't see him doing it. The defensive scheme Jonathan Gannon has simply doesn't work against a team like the Packers. Rushing three down line and having eight guys back in zone is going to let one of the Packers' four receiving threats pick you apart. It's going to let Josh Jacobs have plenty of room to build a momentum, pound it up the middle, and just get those tough yards which keep drives going. The Packers' offense is scoring a lot of points this week. Can Arizona keep up? No. Can they certainly score a bit? Yes. But I think their explosive plays are limited. I think they uh, underachieve somewhat from what we've seen so far. I think Green Bay pulls off the win at home. I am going to hate having to pick the winner of a Cardinals game every single game we have for them for the rest of the season because every single outcome has been weird and you can't really you don't know which Cardinals team you're going to get week in and week out they get blown out by the commanders they lose close to the bills at the beginning of the season they beat the 49ers they blow out the Rams their outcomes are kind of all over the place their offense is very inconsistent the production we get from Marvin Harrison from a box score perspective is inconsistent their defense is not over Overly talented so I agree I think the Packers are going to win this one I know Jordan Love hasn't exactly looked very special yet this season he needs to cut the turnovers down but I don't think that Cardinals defense has enough talent to hang with Dontavian Wicks Jaden Reed Josh Jacobs Tucker Kraft has emerged over the previous two weeks so I think the Packers offense has just too much talent and Xavier McKinney will probably walk away with one maybe two interceptions against Kyler I mean, it kind of feels like a no dust statement but when the Cardinals aren't getting blown out. They can run their offense just fine. They can get James Conner those carries, have nice long drives. So Kyler Murray scramble up, MHJ get open. I don't know if Trey McBride's playing this week. Some questions with his health. But when they get down big, they just can't respond. They can't throw themselves back into a game. Maybe that's on Kyler Murray and his limited ability as a pocket passer. Maybe that's on the Cardinals' complete lack of receiving threats outside their uh, fourth overall pick. I don't know. What I do know is Arizona is not going to win this game. The story of this game is going to be Drake May making his first ever NFL start against a Texans team. And at a glance, this is a terrible matchup. The Patriots have horrible tackles. The Texans, Will Anderson Jr., Daniil Hunter, two freaks on the edge. But freaks are what is going to slow this Texans team down. Nico Collins is not playing this week, meaning their number one receiving option will be Stefan Diggs. And Stefan Diggs is currently dealing with some Diddy-esque off-the-field drama. Some stuff you really hate seeing unless you're a Bills or a Vikings fan. He is going to be under a lot of pressure to perform. And unfortunately for him, we know how Stefan Diggs performs under pressure. We've seen the drops. We've seen the playoff performances against the Chiefs, against the Bengals. He cannot hang. He is not a valuable player when the lights are the brightest, which leaves him with Tank Dell as their leading receiver. And Tank Dell massively underachieved the season, still struggling with that injury a little bit, still struggling from getting shot, just not what he was last year. Joe Mixon, based off the quotes I'm seeing out of his camp, is still hurt. He may play, but I don't think he is as explosive, as productive as he was the first two weeks of the season. This Texans offense is going to be rough, particularly against a very good Patriots defense, which then leads us into talking about the Patriots offense. Drake May is more mobile than Jacoby Brissett. He's more athletic. He played better in preseason. I think he can make better decisions. Admittedly, the talent is not there. He will still get run down by those two elite edges I already mentioned, and their offense will be mostly kept in check. But I think he can do enough. I think he can get him 20 points. Without his function, I think the Texans offense is going to be this week. Thanks to the tragic events surrounding Stefan Diggs, tragic for his victim's sake, I think 20 will be enough. I think Drake may 
finds the young receivers, gets the offense going. Ramondre Stevenson holds onto the ball and does not fumble. Antonio Gibson shows us a little bit something we haven't seen so far. The Patriots crawl, bang their way, squeeze out a tough victory against the Houston Texans in Drake May's first start, starting the May era in New England. Feels like you seem to forget that this Patriots team just lost to the Dolphins who didn't have two as starting a quarterback. This ain't the same Patriots team. This is a bad Patriots team, whether it's Drake May or Jacoby Brissett back there at quarterback. Their only offensive talent, I, now I believe in Drake May, but their only offensive talent is Ramondre Stevenson. And their defense, you said it's very good, it's okay, it's not special, it's not a Browns level defense that we saw carry a bad offense last year. And the Texans, even though Nico Collins is not playing, Joe Mixon might play. Tank Dell is a very, has been a very good receiver, at least during his rookie season. Hasn't had the same opportunities because of all the talent they have on their offense this year. Stephon Diggs, we know what he's capable of. Dalton Schultz probably steps into a larger role in the offense with I Nico Collins off the field. I don't think we want to say field. we know what Stephon Then, when you take a look at the Texans sexual defense. sexual assault allegations floating around him. Then, when we take a look at the Texans defense, they've allowed the lowest completion percentage in the NFL the third least amount of yards per game. They've allowed the second fewest completions in the NFL. So when you're taking on a rookie quarterback in his first start that's playing beha behind a really bad offensive line, it is going to be a long day for Drake May. I fully expect the Texans to win unless they just truly continue to play down to their competition. I don't know if it's playing down to their competition. They didn't play up to their competition against Minnesota. They got absolutely schwaffer donked. They might just not be that good of an offense. C.J. Stroud has clearly exited the MVP race. The Buccaneers are fresh off of blowing a game against the Falcons. They are hungry for a victory, and the Saints are starting a rookie quarterback in Spencer Rattler, and the Buccaneers also have Kalijah Cansey healthy for the first time all season. He got injured prior to the season. So with Kalijah Cansey, Vita Vey on the field against a not overly strong Saints offensive line, an offense that outside of the first two games has not looked very good even from a play calling perspective and running the ball perspective. They need explosive plays in order for the rest of their offense to operate off that. I don't think this Buccaneers defense is going to allow that to happen. I think Mike Evans, he's going to make some big plays against Marshawn Lattimore, and I expect the Buccaneers to win. No player in football history has been more affected, received more flack from a documentary featuring them in high school than Spencer Rattler. What a young Spencer Rattler said as an arrogant little jit has followed him from high school to Oklahoma to the real USC all the way into his professional career. It's not following him this week. For a long time, I have said Spencer Rattler is the superior option at quarterback to Derek Carr. This is the week he proves it. At the bare minimum, I think Radler is certainly going to find a way to get the ball in Chris Olave's hands. He's going to find him over the middle, aggressively attack that linebacking group, which Carr has shown a refusal to do throughout this season. Olave has his biggest game of the season. He can find Kamara in the flat, and he can set up a Rashid Shahid long touchdown just as well as anybody else. The St. Thomas is going to perform better than they have, excluding those first two weeks there where they blew out bad defenses. They are going to be revitalized. Looking at the Buccaneers, yes, they've got their players back. I don't know if they're that good of a defense to begin with. I think they were a little bit overhyped going into the year. They're not quite those guys. They're getting older. Vita Vea, not Vita Vea, Vita Vea being on the field does certainly help that, as does Kalaja Kansi. But I just don't see it being enough. He said Mike Evans is going to get open against Marshawn Lattimore. Historically, Marshawn Lattimore has dominated that matchup. He's got some bad moments, sure. He's a cornerback guarding an elite six foot five physical freak at wide receiver. He's going to get mossed every now and again. He matches up well with Mike Evans. That matchup is going to continue. The Buccaneers offense sputters. They're missing Rashad White. They're going to be dealing with Bucky Irving in his totality in the backfield. Maybe you think Bucky Irving's an upgrade over White. I don't care one way or the other. Having only one functional running back does not help any offense unless that running back is named Derrick Henry. The Saints are pulling off the upset at the Superdome. Spencer Rattler is getting the first win of his career, and we're going to have some awkward conversations about Derrick Carr next week. I would prefer Bucky Irving over Rashad White, and I do think the Buccaneers have too much experience, too much talent. I think that last week's loss really has left a sour taste in their mouth. And if the Saints are able to pull this off, I think it'd be cool to see a late round rookie quarterback succeed to the level you think he will. I just don't see it happen. I think you are overriding level 
I think he's going to succeed. I just think he's better than Derek Carr. That is a low, low bar in my opinion. And is that enough to win, though? Probably. Speaking of low bars, though, the Eagles are playing the Browns. This is the biggest spread of the week. The Eagles are nine-point favorites. They're getting A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith back. And while the sky may be falling in Philadelphia, it has already collapsed in Cleveland, Ohio. Nick Chubb remains injured, James Winston remains on the bench, and this team remains completely dysfunctional. Their defense just can't do it this year. I think they're a fine unit who's getting hosed by the time possession opponents have because the Browns offense just goes three and out, three and out, three and out every single drive. Deshaun Watson is the starting quarterback, and that is going to cost this team games. He had one good performance this year, caused me to have a little bit of faith in him. That has not lasted. No matter how you feel about the Eagles and Nick Sirianni, you must admit a healthy version of this team decimates the Browns. Saquon runs wild. AJ Brown's getting open. Devontae Smith is getting open. It would take a six-sack six sack performance from Miles Garrett to keep this game close. I just don't see that happening against the Eagles' elite offensive line. Give me the Eagles going away at Philadelphia. The Browns do not have a chance at winning football games with this version of Deshaun Watson as their quarterback. And I think we all know at this point, he's not returning to anything that even gets in sniffing distance of what he used to be when he was the Texans quarterback. So the Browns only hope at not having an absolutely miserable future with the Deshaun Watson contract is for him to keep starting for them for him to lose a lot of games and then maybe whoever they draft in this year's draft when they have a top three pick can be their quarterback of the future so they can financially recover from this Deshaun Watson contract I'll let you decide who you think that is gonna have Cam Ward getting mentored by Deshaun Watson Cam That'll Ward be great Shador thing. Sanders yeah Shador and Deshaun Watson what a pairing Oof. I mean I don't think any of those guys, they might refuse to go to Cleveland after what has just happened with Deshaun. Jadar Sanders is likely to refuse to go anywhere, which isn't a big market. That's part of the Dion influence. We don't need to get into any college football talk. I mean, we're in agreement. The Browns are not winning this game. The Colts and the Tennessee Titans. The Titans might as well ship Will Levis off to the German Football League because he is not a competent starter in the NFL. I mentioned how I did not believe in the veteran receivers that the Titans signed during the offseason. Isaiah called me crazy. Other people called me crazy. They said it would work for Will Levis. It made sense. These signings, they were to support him. The Titans were going to have a functional offense. That just has not happened. None of their receivers are on pace to have more than 600 receiving yards this season. That's not going to happen. The Titans don't have a functional offense from a run game perspective. Will Levis turns the ball over. I don't care how bad this Colts defense is. I don't care if Jonathan Taylor isn't going to be playing. The Colts are going to win this game, get uh, their third win on the board, get back to 500, and the Titans are going to lose again. A hateful man filled with bitterness and envy. I don't blame you. I really don't. I understand how you feel about Will Levis to a certain extent, but you gotta move on from it. The uncertainty about the Titans this week is what the quarterback situation is going to look like. Levis got injured against the Dolphins. Rudolph came in. I don't know if I'd say he played well, but he got a win. That's something. Odds are Levis does start this week, and I don't really care who it is. They're going to flatten the Colts. The Colts offense is terrible. Don't let last week fully against a terrible Jaguars team. They can do nothing, particularly in the absence of Jonathan Taylor. The Flacco magic has run out. He used that awful lot of that last year. Ran out of it by the time the playoffs started. I think he's run out of it after one week in Indianapolis. I think Tennessee gets after him, puts him on the ground, forces him to make some bad Flacco-esque interceptions, and keeps the Colts offense low scoring. And I'm going to keep saying it every week, and it will eventually be right. Five in a row is too much for anybody. Will Levis does not have another boneheaded play in him. I choose to believe he cannot go out there and screw things up to the same degree he has been. Maybe the injury has shaken his confidence physically. Maybe the constant clowning has shaken his confidence mentally. Whatever the reason, I think he's going to be more conservative, more poised, and just chill in the pocket. If he doesn't play, he doesn't play. Rudolph starts, they win the game. I think You are a hater of the Tennessee Titans. You are a hater of Will Levis. 
and yet a praiser of Anthony Richardson. It's quite a strange dynamic. It's like you see athletic ability in one player and athletic ability in another player and say, nope, well, that athletic ability is different from that athletic ability. I don't want him as a prospect to develop. I think he is a good. You are an intellectually inconsistent and hateful man of the Mayo and you are Will Levis. I just can't Will stand. Levis does not have as much athletic ability as Anthony Richardson. Hell, Anthony Richardson does have as much mental ability as Will Levis. Say what you want about <laughs> Levis. When he's not. I don't know if I want Will Levis' mental ability. Hey, man, he's completing 65% of his passes. Like, I think it's 70 if you include interceptions and fumbles to the defense. But I digress. Moving on to another young quarterback. You've got the Chargers taking on the Broncos in Denver. And the money line on this game is curious for me. If I was a betting man who didn't have other reasons to gamble, I would pick the Broncos to win. They are three-point underdogs at home in Denver against a Chargers team which is dealing with a lot of injuries. But let's be clear about this. The Chargers have the better quarterback. They would have the better quarterback even if Justin Herbert wasn't playing. More importantly, though, the Chargers defensive coordinator, Jesse Minner, matches up really well with Sean Payton and Bo Nix. He made a living shutting down the short game, shutting down athletic receivers in college, hindering the small stuff, making teams try and stretch the field on them, and then lose matchups to their high-level, elite, man coverage guys in the secondary. That is what Bo Nix and Sean Payton want to do with this Broncos offense. They want to complete the dinks and dunks. They want to keep the ball moving. They want to get as many receptions as they can. That is not happening against a Jesse Minter defense, particularly if they can get even close to healthy, which they should. Their best defensive player got a nice week of rest thanks to an unjust suspension against the Chiefs. Looking at the Chargers offense, Yes, I know we think the Broncos defense is good. We live in Candyland where we ignore the quality of opponents they faced. Whatever. They've still got J.K. Dobbins. The Gus Bus presumably will play. And even if it's behind two backup offensive tackles, they're going to be able to generate a run game up the middle. Herbert can do enough. He can find somebody deep, whether that be Lad McConkey or Quinn Johnson for an explosive play, which can kick this one open. The Chargers are winning on the road, and anyone who picks the Broncos to win is a major jabroni. Weak man to be as big of a hater of the Broncos as you are, and you know, throw a caveat on there at the beginning. If I was addicted to gambling, I would indeed make poor decisions. That is the caveat I put on there. The Broncos are winning this football game, and it's for a lot of reasons that you caveated out of the at the beginning of your prediction to kind of swipe the rug out from underneath my feet. They, the Chargers have t nine starters that are questionable heading into this game, may or may not play. 10 players if you include Gus Edwards as a starter. I don't know, J.K. Dobbins is technically a starter, but he still plays a significant role in that offense. And if both of the tackles are gone, if one of the tackles are gone, if both of their tackles are playing but hobbled, it does not sound good when you're playing a very good defense with both your tackles injured, your quarterback not being as mobile as he typically is because he's dealing with an ankle injury that you're going to be able to push the ball down the field. The charge offense isn't all that great at pushing the the ball down the field anyway or run the ball at a very high level so because of all the injuries the Chargers are dealing with the Broncos Bo Nix played very good last week their defense I think has been underrated all season long I'm picking the Broncos to win tisk 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 has Bo Nix played a defense as good as this Chargers team yet he played the Jets and he had 60 yards we know what Bo Nix looks like when he plays someone who actually has got some stones and hoots on that side of the ball it's happening again. Over on to a classic laundry matchup. The Steelers taking on the Raiders. I don't think too much needs to be said about this game. Unless you are a believer in Aiden O'Connell in the face of all logic and rationality, you know it's going to happen. The Steelers defense after a loss is going to respond by clapping this Raiders team. No Devontae Adams. There's some questions about health of Rashad White. Hopefully he plays. Even if he does though, I think the Steelers defense just suffocates him. They're one of the five best in football and they are going to continue that against a really bad Raiders offense. On the other side of the ball, sure, Fields had a lackluster performance. Could have definitely been better against the Cowboys. But I think Najee Harris gets back on track. I think Fields has a productive, efficient, turnover-free game. I think George Pickens either crashes out in entirety and gets benched or gets himself back under control and stays on the field for 80-90% of the Steelers' snaps. Whatever it is, their offense is going to be better. They're going to win this game, and not much needs to be said about this matchup, unless you've, for some inexplicable reason, predicted Aiden O'Connell to save the day. Najee Harris get, getting back on track doesn't really mean that much because he's never been an explosive runner of the football. I don't believe Jalen Warren is going to be added to that backfield to add that different dimension to their run game. And the Steelers' offense... 
Justin Fields struggled last week. I think it is going to happen again. And Aiden O'Connell, we saw him be productive towards the end of last season of his rookie campaign. There's a lot of players on the Raiders roster that are a fan of his. We've seen Brock Bowers be productive. Devontae Adams may not be on the field, but Jacoby Myers silently over the course of his career has been a very solid wide receiver. Aiden O'Connell getting inserted into the offense is going to give them the confidence boost they need to take down this Steelers defense. And I think next week is when we get to see Russell Wilson inserted at quarterback as the Steelers desperately try and make a change to save themselves from completely falling out. Speaking of completely falling out, you were just punning on this season's record prediction, it would seem, by picking the Raiders to win. I know you hyped them up prior to the season, got a little 100K back banger off that. There's some fond memories of the Raiders faithful. They were all cheering you on. Yeah, someone believes in us. That belief was misplaced. O'Connell stinks. If he cannot beat out Gardner Minshew in camp with all that popular support in the locker room, what does that say about him? You are in for a rude awakening this week. The Falcons offense is humming. If Kirk Cousins was able to throw for 500 yards last week against the Buccaneers defense, he is going to throw for 600 against the Panthers defense. And Andy Dalton, it was nice when he had his first start, threw for over 300 yards, but every start since then, he has gotten worse. The reason he was successful in his first start is that he's a veteran quarterback who's seen everything before. Teams haven't had a ton of film of him from recent games. They were maybe planning to play Bryce Young, looking ahead to the game heading into the season. And I think this is a game Andy Dalton continues to struggle. His performances are getting worse, and Kirk Cousins operates the Falcons offense at a high level. Look, no slide on Andy Dalton. He's playing the best secondary in football this week. I think any team is really going to struggle. Their path to victory is just force-feeding Chuba Hubbard the ball, and maybe Jonathan Brooks is healthy enough to contribute to that in some way. Hubbard has been playing great these past three weeks. If that continues, and even expands upon itself. He has 150 yards instead of 100. I could see this game being competitive. And historically, this is a game where Kirk Cousins has played down to his competition. 425 in the afternoon, road game against a team everybody thinks stinks. This is one of those ones where Kirk goes for 250 yards, touchdown, two picks. Having said that, I just think the Falcons are too good of a team. They've got better weapons. They've got a better O-line. They've got more uh, star players on their defense. And I think they're better... Well, it's hard to make a good assessment of the coaching given what Canals has been working with this year in Carolina. Either way, I got the Falcons winning this one in dramatic fashion. Although if Kirk Cousins stinks it up, it will confirm everything I've ever said about him. Moving on to Detroit versus Dallas. The, Dow the Cowboys' run defense has played much better these past two weeks. Shout out to Mozzie Smith. He has greatly improved against what some might call a lesser rushing attack in Pittsburgh and a lesser rushing attack in New York, but I digress. The Lions are not going to let that continue. They've got one of the two best rushing attacks in football. They are a two-headed monster with Montgomery and Gibbs, and they are going to pound this one out on the ground. With the injuries the Cowboys have been dealing with in their secondary, Goff should be able to do enough through the air to support his guys on the ground. Maybe Laporta finally gets meaningfully involved in this offense once again. Hard to say. On the other side of the ball, though, the strength of this Lions defense is their run game. They can stop any rushing attack, it seems, besides maybe the Ravens. This plays well with the Cowboys who want to run the ball five times this week. They're going to try and air it out over that secondary, rely on their receivers, rely on Tolbert, maybe Cooks gets back in the lineup, rely on CeeDee Lamb to get open and generate stuff after the catch. This should be a high-scoring game. What it comes down to, in my opinion, though, is that this is the Detroit Lions Super Bowl. Last year, they think they got screwed by officiating, which they didn't, against the Cowboys, and they think their season was knocked off its track by that game. They thought they could be the one seed, home field advantage all through the playoffs, and then go to the Super Bowl. That didn't happen. They're going to try and leave, no doubt. Dan Campbell is going to have this team as fired up as we have ever seen them. And thanks to him and a Hutch masterclass, I think the Lions triumph over the Cowboys. The Cowboys got away with one last week. It was cute that Dak Prescott drove down the field and got a game-winning touchdown, but it was against the Steelers team that don't have a good offense. They only, The only chance the Steelers have at competing is when they are in close games and against this Lions team with one of the best offensive lines in the NFL, two of the, the best running back tandem in the NFL, two very good receivers on the outside, plus Sam Laporta playing the tight end role 
goal, the Cowboys just don't have enough talent with all of their injuries to hang with this Lions offense. So I think the Lions, coming off of a bye last week, they're fully rested up. Aiden Hutchinson is going to bully the Cowboys' weaker offensive line, and I think I don't think this is going to be a high-scoring game for the Cowboys. The Lions will put up a lot of points. It's probably going to be like 30 to 10. No, I'll give them 14. I think they could score two touchdowns. Then they get two touchdowns. The beauty of Mike McCarthy, he is capable of playing around some overmatched tackles. We saw that in Green Bay. I don't know if Guyton's playing or not. I hope he does for the sake of Aiden Hutchinson's stats. He will be getting some help. He will not be left on an island with Hutch the same way he's been left on island with other guys this year. Like, Miles Garrett only had one and a half sacks against Guyton in his first ever start. So that was in large part due to guard play and the tight end coming in to help and chip from the backfield. I think they can hinder a superstar edge rusher if push really comes down to shove. That being said, they're going to pass the ball 50 times. Hutch is going to get home at least once, probably twice. So give me the uh, lines. I think we're in agreement on this one. And you talked about certain teams uh, playing down to their competition, only winning close games. I'll let you in for the Giants. The Bengals are headed to MetLife to take on the Giants. People will laugh at me. Isaiah is going to mock me. But the New York football Giants are going to win this football game. They have the most sacks in the NFL of any defense. For the first time in a long time, their passing attack is not in the bottom half of the NFL. I believe they're somewhere around 14th. They have the best non-quarterback rookie in the NFL with Malik Neighbors. I don't care how menacing Joe Burrow looks on the sideline as he glares at their piss poor defense which the defense is giving up the second most points in the NFL. So when you look at the fact that the Giants have the most sacks in the NFL, their uh, offense has not been overly pathetic for the first time from a passing perspective. Last week, Tyron Tracy and that run game emerged a little bit after a poor performance against the Cowboys. And the Giants, they're not a great team by any means. They're not as bad as we thought they were going to be. And the Bengals, with how rough they've looked, on MetLife turf, they are going to fall to 1-5. in five. Bengals fans are going to be in tears. And unfortunately, we're going to have to see even more delusional Daniel Jones supporters. We can stop with the hogwash about the Giants' offense not being dysfunctional. They've played bad teams, and their offense has not scored more than 23 points in a week this year. So they're still very bad. They're still not good. Unless they've got someone jumping over the line of scrimmage, should have been a penalty, and blocking a kick, they aren't doing all that much. That's and not the a penalty, Bengals, by the way. The Bengals losing to the Commanders and to the Ravens is one thing. Those are two high-power offenses, which actually can hang with the Bengals and outpace them. And yes, I know the Giants, a very good defense, a functional front seven. We all like singing its praises here on the Thick Man Inc. channel. Give me a break, man. The Bengals are scoring 30 points, and that will be enough. That will be more than enough against this Giants team. If you cannot drive at will on this pathetic Seattle secondary, if you are reliant on your running backs to get... Uh, separation and create holes and gaps against a pathetic Seahawks defensive line missing its star players, I am not moved. I do not care about all the little things you said. The Bengals are winning this game. They're the better team. They've got the better quarterback. And I'm going to put out my one mulligan of the week. You ready for this one? If MetLife Turf claims another victim, if it, MetLife Turf takes out Joe Burrow or Jamar Chase, I will drop my golf ball and say the Giants win this game. Med Life Turf is cursed ground. That's my one of the week. You are welcome to use your own mulligans at no, any point. No, no, you do not get to mulligan an injury because then you could say any game like the Texans Patriots if CJ Stroud goes down with an injury. Yeah, the be Patriots a, wa are going be a to waste win. of a mulligan. I don't think you realize how likely a mulligan is to hit, man. Like, these are not something like, I'm not saying, oh, if a questionable player doesn't play. I am saying if an unforeseen 1 in 10 chance happens, the, uh, by the way, I picked the Texans to lose, so if CJ Stroud gets hurt, I'm not flipping No, I'm using it as an example to say, I am dropping my mulligan. I'm saying if Jamar Chase or Joe Burrow gets hurt on MetLife turf, cursed ground, the Giants will win. But that's not happening. The Giants are going to beat the Bengals so bad bad they will be left questioning whether or not they should just tank for Travis Hunter or continue to try and win this season you know every time historically you've predicted a dynamic Giants victory it just hasn't gone well every time you've predicted a blowout it just pfft, back in your face <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Robert Sala and the Jets. Monday Night Football, Josh Allen, a familiar stomping ground, MetLife Turf, back-to-back -back games. Someone's definitely getting hurt in this one. The Jets have fired their head coach, and small-minded people are going to say it's a bad move. 
Salah did not have this team ready. He had him committing a ton of penalties, had him starting slow, and you can point fingers at a ton of people, Nathaniel Hackett and Aaron Rodgers, namely. There's a reason Hackett is no longer calling plays for this offense and say, well, maybe Salah shouldn't have got fired. It was time. It was time. If they continued their current trajectory, he was definitely getting fired at the end of the season. Right now, they're trying to save as many jobs as possible and turn the season around. Will it work? Hard to say. They're getting a good opponent to uh, turn things around against this week. The Bills are perceived as good, but have struggled in MetLife in primetime against this Jets defense. I think that probably continues. I think Josh Allen has another subpar game. Not as bad as last week when he was concussed and completed nine passes, but still not up to his normal excellent standards. The Jets offense, it's hard to say. I don't think they are a well put together unit. I don't think they can run the ball well. I don't think Aaron Rodgers is ever going to get on the same page as Garrett Wilson because he is too old and Wilson is too young to see eye to eye on some things. A bunch of bad energy in that building. I think it's going to be a low score. I think the Bills ultimately win due to a superior running game and superior pieces in their defense. Their defense very good at stopping the run when they're not playing Derrick Henry. Not enough is being talked about that. I don't think Robert Sala necessarily deserved to get fired this early into the season considering they were heading into a game against the Bills where they have the opportunity to play for the division lead, but it does feel like he was going to get fired at the end of the season regardless. It feels like a lot of people on the Jets may get fired at the end of the season with how the offenses look because their offense doesn't look to have much hope. And given the surprising nature of the Sala firing, I don't feel like a lot of players in that building knew it was going to happen. I feel like he was a well-liked coach, probably definitely on the defensive Aaron side Rodgers of the ball. I disagree with that. I'm not speaking to Aaron Rodgers, but I think a lot of defensive players probably liked him. I think there's a whole lot of confusion going on in that building. Woody Johnson's going to make a run at David Tepper for the most dysfunctional owner in the NFL right now. I think due to all that confusion, the Jets aren't going to be able to put up much of a fight because they haven't shown the ability to score a lot of points, and the Bills will get enough done on the offensive side of the ball. A sad state of affairs in New York. What is the discourse going to be like, though, if Rodgers goes out and throws for like 380 yards, four touchdowns, one pick? What is that going to look like? It's going to get toxic. That... We are going to be saying mean things about Robert Sala. There is always I the, won't say there is always the interim head coach boost, man. We did not take into account the interim head coach boost. Teams have a winning record after they fire head coach, their head coach the very next week. You know, how come they just don't fire him one week, hire him back, fire him? I hire think him. that would kind of be I think you just need to get a really deep coaching staff and over the course of the year fire everybody. So what we should do is we should have the training staff calling plays in the Super Bowl. <laughs> invest in the top 10 of the top head coaches in the NFL, have them all on your staff, and then each week fire one. You go at least win 10 games. I uh, know, man. See, you're seeing it too small. You got to think bigger picture. You got to get the most qualified medical staff, the most qualified taping trainers, the most qualified independent neurologist, phenomenal film guys, uh, whoever is going and squeezing water bottles. We want him to have at least five years of coaching experience. As many chefs in the kitchen as you can possibly get. Anyway. The best social media team. Yeah, we don't need all that. That has been our week six predictions. Let us know what you think down in the comments below. Use code THICK on Underdog. Gives you bonus cash, supports our channel. Like the video, subscribe, and we will see you in the next one.